This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Ty Andros. Ty is the president of TraderView, publisher of the Ted Bits website, and writer and editor of his very well-recognized newsletter, also named Ted Bits. We will continue from session already in progress. Now, here what we're looking at is um, uh, we're looking at unlimited money printing. It basically now isn't a start and stop. It just is unlimited uh, absorption of uh, of uh, you know bad debt uh, from a government and banking level, and uh, uh, from the financial system. And so as those talk, those uh, bonds we saw earlier uh, go bad, they just are loaded onto the central bank balance sheet uh, with who can guard that they're not failing, and fresh cash is handed to everybody. So the money's being printed a second time, and then we can go through the whole kabuki dance again. But as we talked about Abby and Mark Carney and the outright monetary transactions and and Ben Bernanke, who's very adamant about uh, rescuing the financial system under for any cost. And, of course, you know, the Fed is is owned by the banks, and no one really uh, understands that. But, but when the Fed was given a monopoly on money, it was given a monopoly on money for a couple of, you know, there was a couple of quid pro quos. One is that the Fed will fund the government uh, in an unlimited fashion, and that the economy will be run for the benefit of the banks. Not the benefit of the public, the benefit of the banks. And uh, we are completely in that mode now. Um, I would argue that the whole developed world is just more like feudal, a feudal state with uh, moneyed interests and then everybody else is a serf or a tax slave or, or debt slave or government debt slave, or personal debt slave. But they're wrapped up, their production is wrapped up and transferred to government uh, and to the crony capitalists in three manners. Uh, runaway taxation, uh, debasement, uh, which is stealing um, uh, the money right as it sits in their banks, and, uh, um, and of course, government debt. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, say this, uh, gold is the currency of kings, silver is the currency of merchants, credit is the currency of slaves, and credit is not money. And when you look around the world today, do we see any money out there that's not credit? I don't think so. Well, we do. There's two, gold and silver, and they can't be printed. But uh, other than that, they've enslaved the world. And, uh, and these are the same people that, that the founding fathers knew about. These are just their descendants. And they've had centuries to gather their wealth and power. And they are exercising it right now. And, uh, you know, we will be going through wars, revolutions, uh, dictatorships. Uh, it's all unfolding as we speak, isn't it, Gord? Without question, and and I would argue at an accelerating rate time, and it's global. And now let's look at uh, at uh, what these people are really trying to uh, uh, bring to us. And this is a quote from John Maynard Keynes, and uh, I'd like to read it. Uh, this is a failure of socialism. It's a destruction of capitalism. And uh, quoting Keynes. The best way, most people drop this first sentence off because they don't want you to hear this. The best way to destroy the capitalist system is to debauch the currency. There is no subtler, 
no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society to the, to, than to debauch this currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, and it does it in a manner which not one in a million is able to diagnose. Present company excluded. <laughs> um, you know, the Federal Reserve and progressives in the U.S. government have been debasing the currency and inflating credit supplies in an unbridled manner since Bretton Woods II on August 15, 1971. Since that time, there's been more inflation in the United States and the world than the previous two centuries. The crisis we are in became unavoidable and inevitable on that day. And, of course, capitalism is failing. It's failing to do what it does, produce wealth. It's failing to produce, to give you more of everything for less money. And it's, and it's uh, failing because of debauching the currency and the aforementioned fascists. And it's, uh, it's the only thing that can rescue us. But the rescue will come after the Reformation. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I thought this was going to happen now, but I've been writing about this for a decade. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is like the blob and it's moving along and we're just waiting for, you know, that final little pinprick, but who's it, when is it going to happen and how we don't know, do we? What we do know, Ty, is it's going to happen. That's the given because we're, we're fixing no problems. We're just papering over, kicking a can down the road, avoiding it. And it's becoming bigger and bigger. What exactly will trigger it? I, I mean, I've got some very strong ideas on what it'll be, but it's really somewhat irrelevant. You just know that it's going to happen. Therefore, what you should be doing is fully engaged in what needs to be done to protect you from that event. And there are some very clear strategies that can be implemented. There's some very sound approaches. They're just not bantered around, obviously, in the public. Well, you know, Gord, we're at the point where the socialists in charge, and they are socialists, and they're dictators, they're narcissists, they can smell the end zone. And they are working as hard as they can, you know, um, to do the final collapse of the economies, which they will seize power with to protect us. And something, we all live in something for nothing societies. And a something for nothing society is created when um, the policies necessary for income and wealth creation cease. And so more and four more people are put into dependence on government. And they get more desperate and more desperate and, you know, actually support the people that are preying upon them. But they're like locusts. They eat everything. They eat everything right down to the seat, right down to the roots, just like a, a plague of locusts. They all, they're going to eat the rich, but they're going to eat the poor. They're going to eat the middle class. They're going to eat next year's seed corn. They're going to eat their children's futures. And they're going to attack the wealth creators in their economies till they quit creating wealth and jobs. And I'd argue that's in full bloom right now here and in Europe. I mean, it's an epidemic. And as the economies have collapsed under socialist, fascist, Western welfare state government policies, they will borrow till they can borrow no more. They will confiscate wealth from the private sector at the point of a government gun until there's nothing left to confiscate. And they will print until their currencies are no longer accepted. And, of course, we can see that in various nooks of the world. We can look at Argentina under Kirchner or uh, Venezuela under um, you know, uh, comrade Hugo or, or, you know, Zimbabwe, but, uh, but, uh, the Western welfare states are just in, um, various, uh, degrees of that same descent and, uh, we'll get there and it'll all come all the way. It's like a game of dominoes. It's going to roll uphill. Okay. It's just going from, it's just like a, a pack of killer whales. I mean, it'll get a, it'll see a, a group of regular whales or things they can prey upon, and they will split off one at a time, the weakest, and they'll just go from the weakest to the strongest until they finally get to the center. And that's why the dollar will be the last to collapse. But you know, we have 
whole generations, four or five of them, that really don't understand that they're sitting there holding the bag. But their but their but their uh, their leaders are the people that are preying upon them. And when you see this picture of this delusional young woman in London, or Uncle Sam with his hand out, actually Uncle Sam with his hand out, I would have to say they should have put a gun in there because that's what's being pointed at the American people. And, um, you know, that's what can I say? We, the, the, the governments are a reflection of the citizens and they're predators. They're cannibals. Okay. They're going to eat us all. And they're doing so on a daily basis. And as they do, the incentives to produce wealth just go the way of the dodo bird. But there are solutions, right, John? <laughs> well, there are, but uh, do the people that have created the problem and instigated it and built this to this point are incapable of finding them or even implementing them or conceiving them. And it will only be after the collapse when we hopefully will have some leader that will be like Deng Xiaoping in China and he'll get the bright idea that to get rich is glorious. And, uh, and restore some of the incentives for working your butt off. And But uh, I don't see anything uh, changing that now. And, of course, since uh, everything we've talked about... Uh, One of the things I know is that the um, generally leaders look for and wait for a crisis to be able to implement or make changes because there's just too much... Uh, resistance to any significant changes to fix even very significant problems. We have a monumental, complex, global problem that getting any consensus is, it would be border on near impossible without a massive uh, crisis that would force actions as we began to touch on in 2008. So that's coming, and they're looking for that crisis. What you hope for in that crisis, and, and by the way, during a crisis, People will sacrifice anything to get the status quo back. It's a practice procedure for control and power is to use a crisis when people will surrender anything just to get back to stability and what they had before or some semblance of it. The question now, Ty, is when that happens, where will the leadership and the consensus take us? You would hope that would take us where we would learn our lessons and say we need to go to sound money, restoring capitalism in a sound fashion, etc. History says that's not what happens. What happens is the leaders that take power have quick fixes that are motivated by those who've been behind the scenes waiting for the crisis. Those that have been preparing and putting in a lot of these policies and um, government actions that are just so suspect right now, I said earlier, that are talking about look like some kind of total control police state, they then have an opportunity where they're in the position. They're the suppliers, crony capitalists, who have who are supplying all of the kinds of things that are going to be used to stabilize in an apparent fashion, supplying of foods, supplying of shelter, whatever. So they look at it as a big payday, as they push it over the cliff. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to deliver all the things we would hope that it would lead to in a positive fashion. That's the crisis that we have to worry that may be ahead of us. Well, we only need to look at the physical cliff. That was no victory. I mean, they used that crisis to absolutely screw everybody in the private sector that wasn't uh, inside, I'll call the ring of government. Okay, the corona capitalists, the special interests. I mean, the only people that that, uh, that was beneficial for was the people who were holding the, the government strings and the government, uh, you know, there, there was no victory there, not for the public. And that, that crisis was used absolutely to skewer the private sector and uh, confiscate uh, more wealth. And, Make no uh, doubt about it. The debt went up by $4 trillion with what was approved with the fiscal cliff. And so what was temporary is now full, was full, is indefinite, what was, um, and, and, um, is now passed into law on a permanent basis. So, which means the debt's there, which forces, which almost guarantees a crisis. And the next, and we'll move from one crisis to the next. The next one we'll have will be a debt downgrade or the potential of a debt downgrade as we uh, move toward the renewal of the debt ceiling. 
And then we'll get through that and there'll be another one. But at some point, the crisis will then erupt. And that's when we're going to be asked to make some very, very difficult decisions. Well, we won't be asked that we will surrender our constitutional rights in many regards to have status quo. That's why I really believe there will be a constitutional crisis in the next 18 months. That's assuming that American people will want to fight for it. Because the Constitution was supposed to limit the government, and I'd say that there is and it's unlimited government, so the, the, the destruction of the Constitution is complete. And, uh, you know, you can look at uh, the Obama care ruling by the Supreme Court where this guy legislated for big government. They specifically said in the in the uh, in the legislation, it's not a tax. And he said it's constitutional because it's a tax. I mean, that was that just shows you the Supreme Court's in on it, too. You know, and of course, where do you go and run? I'm going to just say it again. It's these are the greatest opportunities in history. But you have to know what you're doing. You have to know how to bring, you know, we'll call it uh, the functions of money back to your paper. You have to get ready to trade markets for a trade. And, of course, here's going to be one of the biggest trades of them all, isn't it, Gordon? That's right. We're sitting here looking at gold, and we're about to have a debt ceiling increase. And it's very clear it hasn't been priced in. So since it's got to be a bigger debt in- increase than the last one, because the last one ran out in, what, 14, 15 months, they, they need at least 24 months to get past the next election. So, you know, we're probably looking at 3 or $4 trillion dollar increase in the debt ceiling uh, while we have another crisis uh, in 60 days, you know, because the, they refuse to cut government. There has not been a go- cut in government or the baseline or anything else in years, and and, of course, that's the bottom line of the of the progressives, and I mean progressives on both sides of the aisle. Okay, you, you notice that Boehner voted for the fiscal cliff. He, he He's a progressive in disguise. He He's an old-time, old, big government progressive, and he can't. There's actually some people up there that want to foment the crisis sooner than later because they know the sooner we go through it, the sooner we can recover. But uh, we don't. We're not allowed that right now. But, but uh, you know, this is uh, by a guy named. This this chart here is by a guy named Nick at Sharelinks, and I highly recommend his website to anybody. It's a valuable resource. Um, you know, and then. Then, uh, Gord, you, we have some charts of yours, uh, here. Well, let's take a look at them and why don't you give us a, uh, you know, read the tea leaves for us. Well, clearly I just put out a paper, a tie called gold, uh, the rockets in the gantry. And that is literally what the technical charts are showing us right now that we've been in a major long-term consolidation, gold, silver, the precious metals within a massive and major upturn. And so I see us as it, actually in two stages where we have a pretty soon, probably through the first quarter, when the next crisis hits, and it's coming. And I will assume the crisis will probably be around the U.S. debt ceiling um, in a combination with the Japanese rate of printing of money that they have now committed to with the new government. And that's going to push uh, gold up fairly significantly, but it's not the big launch. It's a significant move. Probably we could see upwards of 2100 an ounce and by the way, this is a silver-tipped gold rocket. Silver will move even better and faster than gold, and according to the charts. Then there's a, a little bit more of a consolidation before I think we get the major lift. And that's when all of a sudden this whole concept of rehypothecation starts to unfold through something as simple as a collateral contagion, where this debt is no longer serviceable at any rate, and the printing of money, and you showed charts, Ty that said the printing, not only does the printing not work, but the pump, it's not creating GDP. It's actually going to start taking away from GDP. And we're very close to that. And when that happens, that's when any asset, any unencumbered real asset will have real value. And in other words, anything that's not paper, because a paper is just a claim on an asset. So the gold charts are pretty clearly right across the board. Uh, showing that that's in the cards. Now, having said that, that's what's in the technical charts. And what we've seen consistently is coordinated government intervention. And you just don't know what they'll take. And I'm not talking about money printing, um, because that hasn't been baked in the gold charts, but to the level of it. But other policy formulations that may shock us, 
don't think for a moment we were, you know, you and I were talking about quantitative easing going on indefinitely, but that was a shocking kind of discussion two years ago for us to have. But now it's just everybody just yawns and says that wasn't such a big deal. And it's only begun. Right. Um, you know, like you said, we're waiting for people to wake up. And we don't know what that's going to be. Uh, obviously, gold going up is a symptom of people waking up. It'll be an old oh God or an old oh shit moment at times, what it's going to be. And by that, I mean their realization that the central banks are not solving the problem, that the monetary, people don't understand what monetary policy is not fixing it, and they don't see their, they have completely lost confidence and trust in their government and their political, in the political apparatus. And that's when they realize it's not happening, and that's going to shake them. And they're already seeing that because they won't invest, they're, they're believing the stock market. Right now, they believe they're safe in bonds, and that's a fiction. Well, you know, it's uh, pouring more debt, and it, printed dollars and money, you know, bought bad assets or sovereign bonds. That's just pouring poison. Think what it's going to be like to, when they realize that the bonds are bombs, as you put them. The stock market has not been anything, and they're terrified of it. it is, is, is it with it just volatility alone, ever mind going down and retesting the 2008 lows again, which I see in the charts? Ever mind they can't get out from under their housing because people just don't have jobs and money and the youth aren't, they just see it as something that it, it destroyed their parents and the fighting they saw with their parents over mortgages, et cetera. I've heard this from youth, this specifically from youth in these kinds of comments. So where are they going to turn? And they don't have jobs. Elderly are saying they want to get into nursing homes. We're not even building nursing homes, for example. Our health care system can't support it. That's the oh shit moment. And where do they turn then? What do they do? How do they protect themselves? Well, I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> no doubt about that. Well, that's, that's what people need to be thinking about because there are solutions. There's some very clear solutions, but you need to be, you need to recognize the problem. And we've spent a lot of time here this morning kind of recapping uh, with your themes, though, the kinds of issues. I'm sure to a lot of our listeners, there's nothing significantly new in what we've said. Maybe what's new is it's, we've moved to the stage where we now, we're not speculating on what's going to happen. The governments have been very clear they're going to print. We're now on a road that gives you an investment thesis or an, a basis on which you can start to make logical decisions, not just with what you do with your money, but what, how you begin to construct the way your standard of living and how you plan for the future. Well, Gord, you know, we've talked about a lot of electro, a lot of economics here and social themes and human behavior. But as you well know, I have worked very hard to put together the game plans for this. In wrapping, maybe you can just uh, take a couple minutes to describe to our listeners the kinds of things that, that you do and how this fits together. Because you, I know you, for a fact you've been on this for years anticipating this. Well, the problem is that everybody knows the problem, or at least the people in the communities that I uh, go to and uh, and you frequent. Because, you know, these communities have to be together otherwise because the mainstream media certainly wouldn't pick up the truth. But, uh, uh, Gord, this is the greatest opportunity in history. This is the greatest transfer of wealth from those that uh, are Keynesians and hold their wealth in paper and believe in government guarantees to those that don't. And, um, you know, as these things fail, huge, huge opportunities are made. And, you know, except for a few instances, buy and hold is dead. Uh, right now, either you learn how to make money over a short or intermediate term time frame and make money when markets decline, or you're really, your uh, opportunities are going to be pretty limited. And I'm one of the people that believe that uh, if you hold your wealth in paper, you can't really make money because of financial repression. As you, you're going to, the wealth, your wealth will be cut in half over the next five years. You know, just by loss of purchasing power on a compound annual basis. So what I do, Gord, is I help people first fix their money and restore the functions of money. And because uh, real money is slightly deflationary. It actually buys more next year than this year. And then I put them together with uh, uh, top quality advisors that trade globally. 
um, who are experts at identifying low risk entries in global markets and uh, don't have any bias. They'll go short as quickly as they'll go long and they'll provide a level of professional risk management. So what I do is I, I uh, you know, back a paper with gold and silver um, or, the, or for institutional clients, a basket of, of basics and in, in metals. And uh, then what I do is I put together a profile with the client and we put together a, a group of advisors that we believe can uh, weather the storm and th actually thrive from it. And then we, mit we knit them into little tight little portfolios for each individual. They're, we're a boutique. Uh, you definitely will be dealing with just pretty much only me. And, um, and so I help people put together absolute return alternative investments. And I use the futures market and professional futures money marker, money managers are called CTAs. And then I use some other techniques, like I said, to restore the functions of money uh, so that you can store wealth in it and we can make a real return rather than a nominal return. And I've been doing it for a long time and I have lots of other other uh, solutions, but I really don't want to go into them here. Um, I will go with, into them with the individuals. Um, but you have to do what Juan Mises calls the indirect exchange. And it's how you put your assets in order to go through a currency and financial system extinction event and preserve your wealth and cash flow. And uh, that's, that's a whole other uh, part of what I do. But anyway, you know, Gord, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's been really great. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for years, but it's never boring. No, it, it, we've given lots to work with, Ty. The governments around the world certainly give us lots of fodder to talk about. And maybe more importantly, giving us some phenomenal investment opportunities. And I agree with you. This is uh, going to be the biggest, as currently, the biggest transfer of wealth in history. And for those that can be on the receiving end instead of the giving end, there's going to be, oh, there is some just some phenomenal opportunities. But you've got to do your homework. And anybody who's actually listening to these tapes are people who are doing their homework. The big difference is translating it from an idea and talk to actually taking action. And you'll be very frustrated if this happens. And it's going to happen. And you haven't taken action if you haven't prepared and prepared logical. And everybody prepares different. Everybody has different risk tolerances. Everybody has different investment goals, etc. So you've got to plan those and give it a lot of thought with professionals who can help you with it. But hopefully these tapes at least give people the perspective to listen to things that you don't get from the mainstream media. Ty, all the best in 2013 and um, looking forward to many good conversations like this. All the best. Thanks, Gordon. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.